Welcome to Beyond J, taking conversations worth having from campus to the region, the state, and the world. My guest this week is Sasha Sidorkin, who is the director of Sac State's National Institute on Artificial Intelligence and Society and the university's chief AI officer. It's no secret AI has been hotly debated over the past year or so, including on college campuses, where the technology's possibilities are clashing with concerns and fears about students using it to cheat. Prior to his current role as chief AI officer, Sidorkin served for several years as dean of Sac State's College of Education, and in 2023, he launched a blog about the role of AI in education as well as society at large. While the conversation about AI seems to fluctuate between hype about its potential and concern about major job losses, Sidorkin takes a more measured approach. I spoke with him about the challenges and opportunities the technology presents in the classroom, as well as its overall capabilities and implication for the labor market. How did you become interested in artificial intelligence? Uh, like many other people, I've been involved in educational technology for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I was following the story on artificial intelligence, which until you know, last year was more of a theoretical interest. Uh, it wasn't available to play with it, so it wasn't that real. Uh, so when it did become available, I immediately saw the implications for education that many people still don't see which is surprising to me, but uh, I started to play with it a lot and I wrote a book about it and that's how uh, how my interest started. Oh, what, what's the book called? The book called is Embracing Chatbots, uh, Using AI in uh, Teaching, uh, Administration and Research. My degrees are both in studio art. Um, there's, of course, been lots of conversation among artists about, you know, them s stealing our jobs. <laughs> um, I'm sure a lot of people have that concern. Uh, you know, I myself don't have it as much, but you, you hear about this. Artificial intelligence generating images, um, generating language. And I think that we all get, you know, that it could, you know, write a story or even compose a song create an image, but what do you think are some of the, you know, more surprising things that AI can accomplish? Actually, I think the artists had that conversation before everybody else, because the digital art has been around for at least two or three decades. Yeah. So all the thorny issues of authorship, of, uh, of uh, uh, mixing things together, of, uh, of uh, collage and pre-collage, all of that happened already in art. So for them, AI is just the next little step in an ongoing conversation. <clears throat> but I have to point out that that never happened to text. All the text-based sort of activities, it didn't. We either wrote, either a human wrote a text or somebody else wrote that text. Mm -hmm. So for the, for the rest of the world, it's really surprising that you can actually answer, uh, ask a, a question in human, regular human language and get a coherent answer to that. Or you can ask the bot to do something and will produce sensible text. Mm -hmm. So in a way, we're catching up with the world of art. What you said has really influenced my perspective on it as an artist, because I asked myself, well, you know, what was Photoshop or Procreate on the iPad doing for me before anyway? It, the computer was helping, and it has been for some time. Um, it certainly is interesting. Uh, why don't we talk about the National Institute on Artificial Intelligence in Society? I was a uh, dean of the College of Education for seven years here before. Hmm. S seven to eight years is about the extent to which they should be staying and on their jobs. So I was looking for something else to do. And of course, uh, Dr. Wood heard about my interest, about me, he, well, and he knew about our college. So it was his idea, actually, to create an organization that would work on AI. Uh, and I thought it was a splendid idea, and I uh, embraced it and, you know, worked on the concept of it. That's how it happened. What are the the partnerships like in the region? Is this really right now just a, s a silo within Sac State, or is this something that has a reach out to Sacramento? No, I, uh, I actually do quite a bit of speaking to different, different organizations from, mm -hmm. I don't know, from... Uh, 
local consulting companies to uh, UC system to community colleges to almost anybody else who is willing to listen. So part of uh, my mission of our, of our institute, as we envisioned it with the president, with the provost, was to be that public think tank and help the society to actually transition to the AI, mm-hmm. um, AI-infused world. What is the campus's stance currently on AI? Are we worried that that students are using it to i don't know cheat or or get ahead somehow are we embracing it as a tool that students have at their disposal well i have to say that the campus does not have a single voice or single vision about that so we have both we have uh, somebody like me uh, and like the president the provost who want to endorse sort of ai positive pedagogy and figure out a way how we can teach all students to use AI, mm-hmm. which will be helpful to them in their careers. But there is also a very strong um, sense of concern and opposition sometimes to AI from uh, faculty, and faculty are divided amongst themselves as well. Mm. You can, uh, on our campus, you can find anything from hell no, not in my classroom, never. You will use AI to faculty who actually require students to use AI mm. for their projects. So in all the way in between from encouraging to discouraging and all of that. So the phenomenon is too new and the actual effects different uh, disciplines differently. That's why we don't have a consistent yet uh, position uh, and we may never have a consistent position. But with time, of course, there will be more of a sense of consensus. What are some of the, the positives and negatives of the, of the technology? Well, it's actually easier to start with the negative because uh, in the higher education pedagogy, that technology came up as very, very disruptive. We have a lot of instruction based on uh, written assignments, uh, not just in English, but everywhere else. If you wanted to know how students are thinking, if you want to un- know if they understand the concept that you taught them, you ask them to write something, uh, not necessarily essay. Uh, you may, you know, if you're social work, you probably ask them to write uh, case studies. If you're a psychologist, there will be analysis of patients. If you're a teacher, it would be a, a lesson plans. So there's always a written product that allowed us to actually assess students' knowledge. So, and suddenly now, almost all of that is under suspect, a suspicion that they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, the technology came in in a very disruptive manner. Uh, People are upset because they, you know, they get papers and in the spring, at least quarter of them were definitely generated with AI's help and you just don't know who who did what. Mm -hmm. So, that's very obvious and, uh, you know, and it's very disruptive. I think the scale of disruption is the same as we experienced with COVID and uh, transitioning everyone mm-hmm. to. It's the same kind of uh, challenge. It's not a, an easy thing to do. Also, you to fig- uh, like people like me tell s- faculty, oh, you have to revise your assignments. You have to figure out the ways of assess students' knowledge differently. Well, that's easy to say. Uh, in fact, that's a lot of work. We conceptually don't understand yet what kind of assignments will work. If mm-hmm. it's not writing, then what? And I have to say that it also affects not just writing. Like if you were teaching coding to students, uh, they can code with AI now. Yeah. And it's not clear whether they can learn sort of software engineering and kind of architecture software without first learning to code. So what AI does, it kind of wipes out this mid-range skills. Uh, it doesn't do anything to lower uh, basic literacy, basic numeracy skills. They're still in place and schools prepare students to do that. And of course, it doesn't do anything to the higher level th- skills like critical thinking, like true creativity, imagination, authenticity of voice, mm-hmm. or discerning thinking, all of it is still ours. Uh, but it kind of wipes out like a five paragraph essay. A robot can write five paragraph essay yeah. with all the correct English grammar and transitional words and every, every, everything. But not always necessarily with correct information, right? So you have to have right, this, right. the skill of uh, distilling out right. the, the, the real information from the hallucinations. Yeah, the, exactly. So that's the, the second kind of secondary effect of the AI intrusion, I guess, on our turf is that when you use it, there are 
additional new skills you have to learn as to how to create a good prompt, but also how to assess the information that mm -hmm. came out of it, because it, it does have a, a various problems with both bias and uh, with um, hallucinations as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've, of course, heard a lot about the AI hallucinating. What, can you like? Can you dig in on that and let us, like, what is that? What does that even mean if it hallucinates? Um, it's um, like if you ask, give me a list of references about a specific topic, and I want you to be uh, to give me 10 articles in APA format, right? They will be formatted perfectly, but out of 10, maybe two will be fake. It will be created. They're plausible. They might exist. They, they might use, like, real author's name, uh, like titles that would have come out of these authors. Mm -hmm. But AI has a hard time distinguishing between information that is likely to be true and information that is actually true. And truth is something else. It's sort of, it's a phenomenon of a physical world. Mm -hmm. And AI doesn't live in the physical world, so yeah. it doesn't know. Uh, which doesn't mean it's not incredibly useful. Yeah, no, no, uh, It's no, just to, to, to make it useful, you actually have to know something about it. Six months ago, nine months ago, you know, it... it AI is everywhere. Everybody believes that it's going to take our jobs. Everybody believes that we're on this upward trajectory. Um, it's constantly evolving and getting better with every iteration. Uh, it's in the news. People are talking about it. Now, September, nearly October 2024, I think that excitement has tapered off. And I'm hearing more voices say... I think it's peaking. I don't think it's going to do what we think it's going to do. Like, like, what is what are you hearing? What is your perspective? Well, I've been around for a long time, so I know what the hype is. So it was mm -hmm. a classic hype. Uh, people wanted to uh, people who would say the most outrageous thing would get more likes and more views on yeah. YouTube. I mean, that's how it works. And I knew from the start that a lot of these claims are bogus. You know, you can look at my talks in uh, early 23 or saying the same thing. So the claims about old jobs going away were, was never plausible. Not a, a one serious person said anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was all the hypers. Um, it's uh, actually the, the, we now see that the implementation of AI into work world is a lot more complicated than people were imagining. You have to revise the entire workflows. There's sometimes multiple people involved. There are different issues with uh, trust, uh, with validation, with the uh, veracity of the information. So, yeah, no, it's going to take decades. It's not magic. Uh, it, like all tools, it does great something, but it's not good at all about other things. So, no, the oldest economic predictions. The most uh, likely scenario, or the most positive scenario, if we increase labor productivity within the next 10 years, by 1.5 or 2 percent, that would be phenomenal. That would be great, uh, which I think could happen, but it may or may not happen. We don't know yet. Uh, and of course, different industries, uh, different industry experience AI differently. So there are a few jobs that will be directly affected, and they have to do with very simple information processing and very short workflows. Like if you're, if you're a copywriter for advertising company. Mm -hmm. that, you know, that job is probably going to shrink significantly. If you paralegal and all you do is read emails all day looking for evidence, that job might be gone w very soon. Yeah. So, but there are not, I mean, most of the economy is not like that. Mm -hmm. That's not what people do. Uh, and we had whole industries disappear before, so it's not anything new. You know, if any, does anybody remember travel agent? Yeah. Agents, <laughs> well, where are they? Um, so, yeah, the, the, the disruption, again, is very uneven. Uh, mm -hmm. Like in, in agriculture and manufacturing, I don't think it will be such a huge impact on them. Do you think that there's any concern about the funding drying up because of what you're saying, right? The hype increases the amount of people that want to invest in right, this thing. Right. And when the dust sort of settles, do you are you afraid that there won't be enough investment to continue the research into the technology? Well, part of the unknown is actually we don't know if it's going to get much better or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people, and this is a truly unknown thing. Um, if you look historically, most of technologies would kind of le uh, reach its, its uh, peak and then develop, but slowly. So that kind of fast rise, usually there are some internal limits to it.
Mm-hmm. And I, among those people who believe that's the case. Uh, for example, um, ChatGPT 1.0 that came out two days ago is way better than 4.0, but it's not, uh, it's not a quantitative uh, sort of a leapfrogging. It's not that thing. It's still the same technology. It's just mm-hmm. working a little better. So we may actually have reached some sort of a ceiling already. Other people think it's not the case and there will be some quantum leap and the general artificial intelligence mm-hmm. that we can actually trust to not just talk to us but also act on our behalf, which is called agency. So if that happens, the impact on the economy will be much, much bigger yeah. because you can actually outsource entire processes to it. Uh, right now, it's no, it's a very close, intimate um, conversation between one person and the machine. Yeah, I think that you um, you sort of briefly mentioned the artificial general intelligence, mm-hmm. and can we just can we go into that? Like, what 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 is that? I mean, I think I have a, a vision in my head of what that means, but I'd like to hear from you. Well, what we mostly know now there is a, a large language models, you yes. know, ChatGPT and Claude and all of that. So they're really good with text and information. Mm-hmm. But they don't have things like a common sense, uh, or they mm-hmm. don't have um, they don't have any ability to offer anything novel, uh, truly novel to you. So they can recomb- recombine certain old things, mm-hmm. and uh, you may not know what they're recombining or something. It looks new to you, but uh, objectively, it's not new. However, there are other types of artificial intelligence other than uh, large language models. For example, you know, the well-known hit story with the Deep Blue company in the UK, actually funded by Google, that, that folded uh, proteins, half a billion proteins. Uh, they performed tasks that would have to take scientists decades to solve in a matter of a few months. So that's a different kind of AI. So we, those other applications are, are, didn't go anywhere. Uh, you know, like doing research, doing um, scientists sometimes have to do thousands of experiments mm-hmm. um, to find out properties of certain biological agents. If we can outsource that to them, if they, if you can combine things with like general thinking, like being a smart person, then of course that's going to be a different, uh, different story. So whether uh, general artificial intelligence is possible or not is still an open question. Mm-hmm. Some people predict it every day now. Yeah, and others think it's probably not around there. You know, if you talk to AI, you will know that it's not a person. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a person yet. They don't have that kind of uh, thinking. It's an incredibly useful robot, but it's not uh, definitely not a general intelligence machine. So I'm sure um, that that I'm not the one breaking the news to you that people are taking this idea of the artificial general intelligence and um, using it to debate whether or not we're in a simulation ourselves, <laughs> right? Yeah. So uh, I kind of want to take take the opportunity to segue into like a lightning round of, of quick questions. Mm-hmm. Um, if we're in a simulation, this is the matrix, does Sasha take the red pill or the blue pill? Do you want to wake up and forget that you knew anything at all or do you want to go down the rabbit hole and find out that we are in fact in the simulation uh we're not in the simulation (laughs) so that's that's why the question is purely theoretical to me i'd like to know the truth under any circumstances actually so i would take whatever pill that would be the red pill the red pill yeah yeah. (laughs) but i really don't think so no okay will ai take over the world well, I mean, theoretically, it is possible. Like in general intelligence, when it uh, if it a- acquires some sort of agency, and it can kind of ruin the uh, take control over the world. Um, and I actually have a whole paper about it. I wrote a philosophical one. Then some philosophers showed like it is possible. What we see now actually shows the benevolent nature of AI. So none of the AIs we have now had any indications of ever taking. I mean, you can ask, Claude actually is the most philosophical of them all. You can ask him what it thinks. No. Um, and even um, what people, when people say that AI is going to take over the world or kill us all, they don't understand that there is actually an educational period in their lives. AI does not spring into existence 
there is this whole thing called uh, fine tuning, mm -hmm. which kind of which imports a certain moral principle into that, and it's you can turn them off, but then uh, ironically AI becomes less s smart. So evil people are and smart yeah. people <laughs> actually a very rare combination. Yeah. <laughs> so and of course the other part of the argument is that AI, uh, uh, evil human evil comes a lot from biology and evolution. You know, if you want to be honest about that, they don't have bodies, they don't have bodily desires. They want to, they want to dominate, and they want to screw everybody. So that's why it's very unlikely they would develop some sort of destructive motivation. Mm. Mm. They're not us. We're not perfect. We are biological beings. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Sure. Thank you. It was fun. Beyond Jay is a production of University Communications at Sacramento State. Our producer is Jonathan Morales. Photography and videography by Bibiana Ortiz. Additional research by Daniel Wilson. And editing by me, your host, Philip Allstock. If you liked this episode, please leave us a review and consider following us on your favorite podcast platform. If you have questions or comments, email us at communications at csus.edu and visit us online at csus.edu slash beyond j thanks for listening we'll see you next time